IT Engineering Lecture 2, Segment 2. In the first segment, we looked at how you can evolve security policies and safety policies, either top-down or bottom-up. And um, we ended by looking at the case of nuclear command and control, where you want to ensure um, that individuals are, as far as reasonably practical, um, constrained from doing very bad and dangerous things, uh, un unless it is deliberate and necessary. I'm going to explore this a little bit more now by looking at bookkeeping. And in this slide, we see an exhibit from the British Museum, um, a set of bullae from 3300 BC in the ancient Near East. Um, when we started living in cities and invented agriculture, um, there's a problem uh, that we had to solve. Um, in October, September, you've got lots and lots of um, harvest, you've got bags of wheat, you've got um, jars of olive oil, and you take them to the village storehouse for the storekeeper to keep so that you can go and get them in March when you're hungry. But then how do you prove um, how many bags of wheat and how many jars of oil you put in there? The solution that people come up with was the bully. Um, the idea is that the warehouse keeper um, would give you little clay models of the things that you had left there, um, whether it was wheat or oil or um, whatever. And you can see these here. And what happens is that these get pressed into a bigger ball of clay, which is then fired. And you then take that home with you. And a few months later, when you go to get your food back, you can show, yup, um, three bags of wheat and um, uh, three jars of olive oil, please. And if there's any dispute, you can show the clay to anybody who's standing around and call them to be a, a witness in your favour. A um, couple of thousand years after that, this led to the evolution of writing because people figured out that making cuneiform marks on the surface of the clay tablet was more efficient. And writing basically followed from that. Fast forward to 1100 AD, and this is a document that was discovered about 15 years ago um, in the university library by our professor of Hebrew. And um, this comes from a synagogue in Cairo, uh, where in about 1100 AD, these documents were just left in a pile. And uh, I, I can't read Hebrew, but I'm assured that this is the first evidence of double entry bookkeeping anywhere in the world. What double entry bookkeeping tries to solve is the problem of how you manage a business that has grown too big to staff with your own family members. And previously it was thought that this had been invented in Venice round about the end of the 13th century, but it turns out that it had been done earlier in Cairo. Now the idea with double entry bookkeeping is that each entry in one ledger is matched by opposite entries in another. So if you're a company and you sell £100 of goods and credit, you write down £100 in the sales account, right, because that records the fact that you made £100 worth of sales, and you debit the receivables account, which shows that you are due £100 from the customer when they pay you. And when the customer does pay, you credit the receivables account and you debit the cash account. And since all these accounts are typically held by different clerks, this means that bookkeepers have to collude in order to commit fraud. OK, that's the idea in theory. Um, how does it work in a modern big organization like uh, a university? Well, um, when I want to go and buy some equipment, say I want to go and spend £10,000 to buy an oscilloscope for our hardware tamper lab, then first of all, I've got to get the money. So I go and get a grant uh, from a research council or a donation from a charity. I then have to go to our central administrative office, the old schools, to register the supplier. And I then get um, Lewis and Storrs uh, to sign an order form and send it off to the supplier. And in due course, the oscilloscope arrives and Lewis receives it and he brings it to me and I check that it works. And the supplier then sends an invoice to accounts and um, um, the ladies in accounts uh, check with the storeman that the goods have arrived and they check with me that they work. And they then tell the old schools to pay the supplier. And the finance office then uh, puts the supplier on the um, um, list of bills to be paid at the end of the week. And in due course, I get a statement of the amount of money that's left on my grant so I know how much I've got left to spend. And maybe once a year, the auditors come round, either from the university or from the grant giver, and they check that I've been spending the money on worthwhile things like oscilloscopes 
and not just in taking my whole team out to Thetford to go paintballing. And that's the standard way in which you do separation of duties. It makes it difficult for me to um, steal money uh, from um, our grant funds, but relatively straightforward to spend it on, on, on things that I can justify. And the other approach is doing it in parallel. If a transaction is large and irreversible, such as a very large payment or a guarantee, um, then you typically require two or more signatures. So if the university's uh, investment office decides to go and buy, oh, I don't know, $20 million worth of shares in Google, um, then there's some, some procedures will have to be gone through to authorize that um, payment to be made to the broker. So a question that many of you will face as you go and work as engineers in banks and other companies is how do you go about designing such a system? And the answer is, as you um, saw in the previous segment, that the design of such systems tends to be a matter of evolution from systems that we have already. And when you're looking at a system of internal controls, you can either start top down, you can look at the bad things that you don't want to happen, um, such as um, crooked accounts clerk, or nowadays more likely, suborned PC in the accounts office, tries to send 10 million to where it shouldn't be, um, or else you can do it bottom up and you can look at the kind of things that might fail um, and um, what you're going to do about that. So you might look generically at what do you do about the problem of um, malware attacks uh, on PCs and accounts. Do you see to it, for example, that if um, two separate clerks have to um, authorize a large payment, that one of them uses a PC and the other one uses a Mac? These are the kinds of things that you have to think about when you're evolving such a system. But that's not all, because you have to think about scaling. In an organization the size of the university, with 8,000 employees and 20,000 students, you can't have the sysadmins sit down and um, fiddle about the Unix access control uh, bits um, for every single thing that's going to be done. And so you need a means of decoupling policy and mechanism in order to make things manageable. So how we do this is we've got a number of roles. In the university, for example, um, Alice may be a lecturer, and um, as such, um, she's entitled to see past exam questions, including um, answers, and she's also allowed to contribute um, future exam questions to this year's Tripos. If she's also an examiner, um, she'll have even more privileged access to future exam questions because she'll be one of the people who's collating the future exam questions. Meanwhile, if Bob is a student, all he can do is see past exam questions and for the last five years or so of questions, he can't even see the answers. And if Charlie doesn't have a role of being a lecturer or an examiner or a student, say Charlie is just an accounts clerk, um, then Charlie has no business um, getting at exam questions um, any more than any random person can do from the university's website. And so what we do in order to get things to scale is you've got one mechanism whereby you write a security policy saying that certain roles can perform certain actions. And then you've got another mechanism which says that certain individuals have certain roles. Now, how long somebody um, inhabits a role um, is a matter for the application. If somebody's appointed as a lecturer, they're appointed to the retirement age, but if somebody's appointed as an examiner, that might be only for this year. We already um, mentioned um, roles when we talked about access um, definitions in the first lecture. The officer of the watch, for example, is the person on a warship who stands that particular watch and who for a period of four hours or eight hours is in command of the vessel. Um, in banking, uh, you have got concepts such as a branch manager and a branch accountant. In, in the health service, the access control rules um, tend to talk about junior doctors and senior doctors, about charge nurses and ordinary nurses, for example. So a junior doctor will be able to see all the records of all the patients who have been treated in their department, and a senior doctor will also be able to see the records of patients in other departments subject to audit checks. And so what you do when you write a security policy is you come up with a few dozen rules 
um, which describe how people in a few dozen roles um, can access, can read, can um, write, can append, uh, 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 and so on, um, and, 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 and deal with data in appropriate ways. However, role-based access control isn't just used at the application layer. It's also used for internal technical purposes. And when you see that an operating system supports role-based access control and multi-level security, um, this is often used for internal purposes. For example, in order to make parts of the operating system on a laptop or a phone um, resistant to tampering by applications, uh, mandatory access control rules are used for that. And role-based access control use uh, uh, mechanisms can also be used, for example, um, to um, determine which users of a Unix system can um, mess around with a DNS server. So we're going to come across role-based access controls at various levels in the, state, in the stack at future um, lectures in this course. So to sum up, security and safety policy basically says, what are we trying to do? Where we're principally worried about security, we start off with a threat model, you know, with a concept of what bad people might try and do, um, which bad things to our system. And we use this to, to drive a security policy, which can start off um, being um, a high-level policy, such as there will be a multi-level security policy in the department with top secret, secret confidential, and so on, or that our bank will have dual control with appropriate separation of responsibility between uh, staff in order to minimize the risk of abuse or fraud. In the case of safety, you start off with a hazard analysis. Um, for example, in a single-engined aircraft, you will say that you have to um, manage the hazard caused by engine failure, and you then end up with safety standards for the uh, design and testing and um, overhaul of the engines, uh, for fuel, for this, that, and the next thing. And you refine these progressively um, to protection profiles, safety cases, and so on, and you implement them using various mechanisms, usability, engineering, firewalls, protocols, access controls, uh, redundancy, and so on and so forth. Now, um, one final point um, here at this top-level view of security and safety policy is that we have to make sure that they all work together. You have to see to it that if there is a vulnerability at the technical layer, there is something at the usability layer that can catch it. For example, in a commercial aircraft, if one of the engines fails, um, then you have the pilots there who are trained to fly the plane back to the nearest airport on one engine. That's just one example. We'll come across many more. Now, stuff tends to fail when holes in the defense layers line up. And so we've got this conceptual model um, from Reason, which is the Swiss cheese model. The idea is that you can have some holes in your cheese, uh, but none of the holes have to go all the way through. And therefore, what we have to do when we design a safety policy or a security policy, and all the mechanics to implement it and test it, is we have to ensure that the human factors, the software, the procedures, the hardware, and so on, complement each other in such a way that we manage the risks in, 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 in the way that we want.